your words have to match your actions. So when you talk about wanting to have uh, impact in the community or in the firm, you, you have to behave that way as a, as a practice as well. Business of Architecture, episode 263. Hello and welcome back, Architect Nation. I'm Enoch Sears, and this is the show where you'll discover tips, strategies, and secrets for running a profitable and impactful architecture practice. Today's guest is coming on the show to talk to us about building a purpose-driven firm. Daryl Condon is the managing partner at HMC Architects, an 80-person firm based out of Vancouver, British Columbia. In today's show, he's going to talk about how they focused in and how they discovered their purpose as a firm and how this firm has fueled their growth exponentially. Also, why you should consider what your purpose is beyond just making money and serving your clients with great architecture. If you haven't already, be sure to download the free four-part architecture firm profit map video that I've prepared specifically for podcast subscribers by going to freearchitectgift.com. If you enter your best email address on that page, you'll get instant access. Today's podcast is sponsored by BQE Core and Sage Glass. BQE Core is an all-in-one firm management software. They've been around a long time, recently came out with this new product. You can have everything you need to manage your firm within your pocket. That means project billing, expenses, timesheet tracking, and all the other metrics that you need to run a profitable firm. You can get a free trial by going to businessofarchitecture.com forward slash demo. SageGlass is the manufacturer of highly intelligent, reliable, dynamic glass. SageGlass tints automatically to optimize daylight, reduce glare, and manage heat, all while keeping open and unobstructed views to the outdoors. Go to sageglass.com to find more about this remarkable material and to see if it's a fit for one of the projects that you're working on. And now, on with today's show. Daryl Condon, welcome to the Business of Architecture. Thanks. I'm glad to be here. So you're the managing principal of HCMA Architects, and it's always exciting for me to speak with a managing principal because it means that I would assume you're more focused on the business side of the practice, the management, things like that. Uh, Tell us a little bit about, give us some background. What is HCMA Architects? Yeah. um, So we're a firm that, uh, you know, it's got about a 40 year history. We've gone through a, you know, a couple of successions, uh, over, over that time. Um, and in our current form, uh, we've really emerged over the last sort of five or 10 years in, in, our, in our current form. Um, we're, uh, uh, so we come from a traditional practice uh, approach to architecture, very heavily focused in, um, in public buildings, public sector uh, clients. Um, and then more recently, as we've been evolving, we've been evolving into an interdisciplinary practice. So we've been adding additional design disciplines to our core architectural practice. So in my role, and as, as, as you've alluded to, uh, really for me over the last number of years, I'm much less project focused. And really the, the design project for me right now is the design of the firm. Well, let's talk about that. To you, what does it mean to design the firm? You know, I think a lot of architectural practices just kind of happen. You know, you get a couple of people together, they figure they're compatible, they get along. Project comes along, the next project comes along, and eventually, you know, a, a firm develops. And there's, it's not very often that there's a lot of intent behind that in, in terms of what, what, what are our overall objectives? What are we trying to accomplish a, a, as a practice? And, and I think, uh, particularly when you're going through moments of succession or at, at key stages, uh, those are opportunities, but really moments where you have to reflect and say, okay, what, what, what have we accomplished so far in our practice? What do we want to accomplish moving forward and, and be much more intentional about, about how we craft our practice to, to, to reach that, that aim? Uh, I, I, I reached a point in my career where, where I'd had, you know, when I've had uh, a good share of success, I've been a lot of really interesting projects and, and, and great clients. And I started asking myself, okay, so what, what's next? How, do I, how am I going to look back on my career 20 years from now? And, and so that led to a process of, of really being very intentional about the direction of the practice um, and, and, and to really start shaping the practice with that, with that in mind. Okay. So it sounds like you've, uh, it's no longer our purpose is to make a profit, our purpose is to employ people, our purpose is to do architecture. It sounds like you're speaking about another purpose beyond that. Yeah, I, I think that we we have uh, our path is very um, clearly purpose driven. 
uh, we're not afraid of profit. Uh, we're very happy to to uh, to have a s- successful business, and obviously, empl- keeping our employees uh, happy and employed is is a key part of our our, our success. Um, however, and, and maybe it's as a result of of the more public focused uh, work, we've developed a philosophy and a concern about how our work uh, affects the community, uh, and, and looking for a broad range of ways to impact the community, and and through that. Uh, we've developed a very clear purpose. And as we've designed the firm, we've done it with an intent to maximize our, our social impact uh, and a positive social impact uh, in, in the communities that we serve. And, and that's been really informative and it has allowed us to, to make decisions around the structure of the firm, around the type of work we pursue, around the type of people we hire, uh, because it's given us very really uh, good clarity as to, as to wh- what we want to accomplish as a practice. How do you, how do you measure social impact? Well, that's that's a great question, uh, and it's a key question. When you when you, it's easy to say, you know, we're going to commit to this. This is this is what we believe in, and this is is what we want to accomplish. And then you said, okay, so what does that mean? Uh, and then you look for a definition of social impact or of social sustainability, uh, and you realize that it doesn't exist. Uh, that this is one of those soft areas uh, where uh, it's ambiguous, and you have to get comfortable in that ambiguity. Uh, to be able to to move forward, so we've had to make our own definitions. We've had to create our own um, understanding of what it means uh, to uh, to how to to measure our impact and and to 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 feel like we're on on the right the right path. And what does it mean for you? Well, we um, uh, it probably probably the best way I can describe it is is to explain how it is. The, the, the multifaceted nature of the of the of the of the effort. Um, we um, we start by looking at the work that we do, the type of work that we do, um, and and that is the type of project, uh, the nature of the client, the nature of the impact of that project, and that's the probably the most obvious uh, way of of being able to channel uh, uh, your work around social impact. But we also look at the way we do it, uh, the processes we utilize. Um, the the systems that we use both internally and when we're working with communities uh, and, and trying to understand the um, the nature of of how we work uh, and and what legacy that can leave and and, and again probably the, a tangible uh, way to explain that or to understand that is in the way that we're doing public consultation uh, we've brought in uh, IAP2 specialists uh, trained um, that really understand how to work with communities in a much deeper level. We're using our our communication designers uh, uh, to to work with communities and communicate with the designers in a much much more sophisticated manner. So that's an, an example of how we're, how we're doing that. And so so the first was the work itself. The second is how we do the work, and the third is is looking at the entity itself. And we say, you know, we're an 80-person architectural practice. And we ask ourselves, what is the capacity of a, of a firm like ours to have impact beyond our projects and beyond the things that we do with our, our clients? And so, so we look at, you know, what is the voice that we can have in the community? What is the contributions we can make? What, what, are, the, what are the ways that we can give back? Um, and, and so that's sort of the third tier of, of how we... Uh, uh, how we gauge our responsibility or take our responsibility uh, for meeting that overall objective. So Daryl, when we started out and I asked you about being a managing director, you instantly honed in on kind of deciding what the overarching thing was going to be of the firm, where you were headed. And you've broken that down into social impact. And then we're talking about uh, how that manifests itself through the work, how it manifests itself through uh, how you do the work and then through the entity itself. Tell me about that process of coming up with that purpose, actually designing the firm. Let's get kind of down in the weeds. How did you, how did you do that as a leader? Um, were previous owners involved? What did that look like to come to a consensus and start to implement this? Yeah, I, I wish I could say it, it happened easily or quickly or, you know, that a light bulb went off and all of a sudden it, it was clear and it really wasn't that for us. I would say that um, there's been a series of, of sort of pushes and pulls in terms of our our priorities and our objectives um, that have found their way into our practice over a number of years, and um, you know, partly through dissatisfaction with with the sort of direction of conventional practice, uh, partly through really understanding what is it in our work that really drives us and what really excites us when we see the impact of our work. So, just a variety of things. I would say it was like 
it was all these aspects sort of in a cloud. And over time, it became clearer and clearer. And at some point, it became clear enough that we could kind of grasp it and say, well, wait a minute. Actually, this is what motivating us. This, this, is, this is that sort of uh, notion of who we are that is truly at our core. Uh, and so it, it really evolved. And we, we did it, um, how we did it was through uh, a lot of soul searching. We had a business consultant that helped us, really challenged us to um, understand ourselves and to sort of call us out when we, we let ourselves off the hook and, and whatever, you know, um, and all the things that, that, that go with that. Um, and of course, the, the phase of succession that we were in really gave us the opportunity to, to reinvent ourselves. Um, and so a lot of things came together uh, at once and, and, and this sort of clarity emerged um, uh, through, through that sort of more lengthy process. Okay. And when you talk about this business consultant challenging you, not letting you off the hook, what does that mean specifically? Can you give me an example? Well, I, I suspect our partnership uh, is is like many others. Um, you know, you, you you become friends, you um, you have a lot invested in each other, um, and sometimes it's hard to hold each other accountable. Uh, it's hard to make tough. De- we we had a habit of make hard. It's hard for us to make tough decisions, um, and we avoided some of the awkward conversations. And so this the consultant that we 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 used was really good at sort of getting to know who we were as people helping us understand how to relate to each other as, as partners and really call us out when, when it was hard for us to call each other out. And, and through that, we've actually uh, developed a much healthier way of, of operating as, as partners uh, where we're much more comfortable uh, holding each other accountable and, and calling each other out when, when, when it needs to happen. And it's inevitable in any, in any relationship or any partnership or any firm or corporation, whatever it might be. Um, that you need to develop the trust and you need to develop uh, sort of the mechanisms to do that in a way that is going to be constructive. And, and uh, I think as firms grow up, that's a difficult thing. Uh, you don't necessarily come to it on your own. Uh, uh, at least we didn't. And so to have an external um, uh, set of eyes and ears uh, in our partner discussions, it really, really helped us um, to move to move forward. And give me an example of when it might be appropriate to call another partner out uh, hold them accountable and what that would look like. Um, it could be, um, it could be related to a project or project type that say is continuously challenging for us or continuously financially problematic. Um, but somebody might have a passion for, um, and, um, so sometimes it's hard to come to a point where you say, well, look, why are we doing that type of work? You know, wh- why, why is that part of our portfolio? So that's an example of of uh, sometimes it's staffing related or or an HR related issue where um, we're having challenges and sort of uh, moving forward or dealing with um, uh, issues there. Uh, you know, when it's when there's personal aspects, it, those are we found particularly challenging. Um, sometimes it's about direction of the firm. It, it's about you know are we all pulling in the same direction and. Uh, you know, sometimes you overlook the clues in the, in the discussions you're having around uh, where there may be misalignment, where you may need to shine light on that misalignment and say, well, wait a minute, what's going on here? Are, are, are we all on the same page? And the earlier you, 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 you sort of have those discussions, the healthier you are. And uh, it's really helped us uh, be much better. And, and that uh, being better at ensuring alignment earlier has enabled us to move forward much quicker. And what do these conversations look like when you're coming to consensus on this idea about what the firm will be? Uh, what ex- Did you have some exercises that you went through? Was it just meetings that you held on a continual basis? How did you make that process actually happen? Uh, we have, uh, we have and, and, and had through that process uh, monthly um, day-long partner meetings. Uh, where we we touch on a number of issues, some more current in terms of day to day issues related to the firm, but really a, an organized and structured forum where we uh, uh, were expecting and prepared uh, and challenged to to have that that sort of conversation about what's over the horizon. Uh, if you don't schedule that time, if you don't actually insist on that, um, and so that you know other meetings can't take precedence and and so on, uh, it. it it doesn't happen, right? There's just too much that goes on in the day-to-day practice of an architectural firm um, that can get in the way of of that those longer-range, more strategic uh, 
issues. So for us, having a very rigorous process that was predictable, uh, and you know, we'd be offsite for for a day a month. We are offsite for you know, we continue to do that. Uh, that was really really critical for us to get through the. Uh, the issues that went beyond just the day-to-day or month-to-month uh, issues in, in running the practice. What would be some of those issues that go beyond the day-to-day? Setting goals. Um, you know, really asking ourselves, what do we want to be five years from now or 10 years from now? Uh, and then working back from that and saying, okay, what are the steps that uh, that we want to, to put into place to, to achieve that? Um, you know, goals like, you know, uh, where 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 do we go next? Are we going to have additional offices or you know additional markets? Where where in the country or where in the world do we want to have have impact? Um, you know, it's not just responding to RFPs or opportunities that might show up on your doorstep. It's been very intentional about okay, this is where we think we can have impact, and and it takes time to have those types of those conversations, to have the space to to have them. Awesome. Now, so it sounds like you're, you discuss things like growing intentionally and kind of longer term planning decisions. Where do you see, where do you guys see the firm in, in five to 10 years? Well, increasingly, um, uh, we, we're, we've embraced what, uh, an interdisciplinary model, as I mentioned earlier. And I think that, um, for us, uh, it, it gets to a core belief that we have around what society needs from architects moving forward. Uh, and the nature of the problems and the questions that we're going to be getting involved in that are increasingly going beyond the physical design uh, of, of, uh, of our projects. Increasingly, we're designing the social construct as well as the physical construct. Uh, and the issues we're dealing with in our communities are much more complex than, than what an architect typically can handle on their own. And so we believe that by bringing in an interdisciplinary bringing an interdisciplinary model uh, and other types of designers and other types of thinkers to the table that we can better solve the complex issues that, uh, that we face. And so um, we, um, we're, we're, we're getting involved. We're already getting involved in a much wider range of, of issues from, from strategic planning for not-for-profits to a wide range of facilitation to, to branding to um, strategic communications uh, sometimes related to our architectural projects and oftentimes completely disconnected from our architectural projects. So we see that a lot of growth in that. Um, and, and we also think that the, the, the clarity of our social impact methodology and, um, and uh, purpose uh, also uh, has resonance far beyond our, our current local market. We're seeing that already. We're getting asked to get involved in, in projects um, in, in other parts of the country, other parts of the world, um, because I think there's a timeliness now to, to this issue of, of, of uh, social equity and justice and, and what that means for, for architects. And, and so um, we're not quite sure where we will be in five years, but we, we really believe that our uh, the footprint of our practice is going to be much wider than it is currently. And we're already, we're already seeing the, uh, without a lot of, of uh, marketing or with a lot of, of effort where people are coming to us now asking us those questions from, from, from other places. And, and so that for us is very encouraging. It's telling us that there's, there's a lot to that model and that we are on the right, the right path. So when you talk about setting goals in these meetings, what kind of goals are you setting? What do they look like? Are they quantifiable goals? Are they more uh, strategic planning? There, there are a variety of both quantifiable and, and less quantifiable goals. I mean, we do discuss goals around around revenue and around uh, the size of the firm, but but we really, um, uh, you know, profitability targets, those types of things. Um, however, we really try to avoid defining our goals around uh, the size of the practice. We really are are attempting to design it around the impact. Uh, that we have and let the the impact um, that our growth as a firm really be the result of of uh, that broader uh, objective um, and it's interesting because as our purposes become clearer our firm has become much stronger and and our growth rate has increased almost exponentially from what had been traditionally a very very stable growth so the marketplace is responding quite powerfully to to this um, to, to to this approach. So so some of those goals are 
as I said, are quantifiable. But the less quantifiable goals um, would would be around the types of organizations that we're involved with, the the uh, uh, the nature of the impact we can have uh, in in the community, um, the growth of our staff, uh, growth of, of of the partners uh, in terms of their own personal development. Uh, so it's really a mixture of both quantifiable and and uh, uh, more uh, ephemeral goals. Okay. So you, you mentioned you mentioned revenue. You mentioned profit. Uh, what profit target uh, do you guys set as a firm? Um, we um, that's that's a that's a difficult question for for me to answer because we we haven't uh, we haven't really set a specific uh, profit target for the firm. We uh, we do compare ourselves to uh, you know to the best of our. Uh, Ability through source of information, we we see you know we compare ourselves to other other firms. Although we don't, there's not a lot of firms that we see are on a similar path or have a similar structure. So it's really hard to to get metrics. I would say, however, that right now we're not satisfied with the level of profitability of our practice. As we've grown quite rapidly over the last couple of years, and and we have out uh, outreached our reach beyond our systems, and so now we're in a phase of kind of pause and in having our systems catch up and really focusing more on you know when we were a 50 person practice driving our our you know managing our work uh for our profitability targets was much easier uh, than we are now at an 80 person practice with systems that were really probably more suited for 30 to 40 person practice so we're now in a in a phase where we're we're going through all of our systems and updating them uh and 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 really putting them in place for the next stage of our practice and and through that, we are we are looking to build the sort of uh, management model that is going to uh, allow us to have an appropriate level of profitability for the next stage of our growth, not necessarily for the, the last stage of our growth. Sure. And so, uh, understandably, you said as you've grown and as you scale, that's adversely affected the profitability because, of course, that that consumes a lot of resources and money to grow from to hire people to train them. Um, when you say that you guys aren't really content with where it's at right now, like percentage wise, what, what would you say it's at? Are you guys talking a couple percent? Are you talking 5%, 10%? In terms of, of how, how much improvement we'd like to make? Profitable, profit, like profit at the end to profit margin. What are you guys running? Um, you know, it, I don't have those numbers in, in front of me. Um, and it really depends on, um, what you consider profit. You know, when we look at different firms, uh, if you're including the um, uh, the base, or the draws of the the partners, or profit beyond base draws, or or, or salaries, um, you know, when we look at uh, our overall profitability, we're in about in the middle of the pack of what we see uh, firms of of our nature, and to us, that's that's not good enough because we want to invest in in the uh, in we want to. We, we're right now. We've been putting a lot back, both into our systems and into the interdisciplinary model. Uh, and uh, you know, we need to be able to drive our projects more profitably. Be able to continue to do that. Okay. So yeah, I'm referring to you know um, uh, profit before taxes, before distribution. So middle of the pack generally is about eight to ten percent. Does that sound like that's about yeah, in the that, hunt? That, that's about our range. Okay. Um, yeah, thanks for exploring that because I know a lot of our listeners, you know, there's so much times that we avoid the conversation about profit and money. It's good for people to know a benchmark of where, well, let me go back and look at my books and see where I'm at in terms of my profit and taxes uh, before taxes and distribution. So let's go back to the this idea of purpose and culture. Uh, how did you uh, to what extent was the staff involved, people who aren't at the lead, top leadership level involved in creating that, that purpose? That's, uh, it's, you know, you've, you've hit on a really, really important issue um, because, of course, as, as the um, you know, we've, got, we've got partners, we've got associates and directors, and then we've got our, our, our staff. So that's kind of three tiers within, within the, the office. And I would say that you know, the partners were all very involved in the development of, of our, our, our intentions and our, our purpose. And throughout the process, that sort of leadership level of the, of the associates and directors uh, had less frequent but sort of periodic involvement. And so they were brought along um, uh, along along the way, uh, the, the general staff to a lesser degree. And so we did have a challenge 
in terms of telling that story to the staff and, and really explaining where we're going and why and why they were seeing certain things uh, taking place uh, in in the firm, and it's been it's been interesting because um, quite uh, as you would expect, I think we've experienced exactly what you'd expect is that as we've changed and as we've said no, we don't see ourselves as a traditional architectural practice any any longer. Uh, we've had people, we've had good people uh, that have said that have, in our firm say. You know what? That's not for me. Um, and they've self-selected and they've they've decided to go in different directions and said, you know, I'm I'm at quite comfortable in a more traditional architectural practice, and that's great. You know, um, uh, but we've had uh, uh, more people, far more people, not only uh, that are we're already here, say, you know, that's exactly uh, what I want out of my practice uh, as well. But we we've, we've attracted so many good people over the last. Uh, few years as we become clear and as we've been putting out there what we're about um, we've attracted so many people that have come to us knocked on our doors and said you know what that's I want to be part of that that that's that's what I'd like to accomplish in my practice so we're seeing uh, um, uh, tremendous impact in our ability to recruit top people um, because they align with that purpose and and um, so it's been really it's really beneficial, but that transition for some has been difficult, and and a lot of it is you know is is being comfortable in this sort of ambiguous zone of of something that's changing and it's something that we're not quite sure what it looks like at the end, and not everybody's comfortable in that. But those that are 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 really thriving, uh, and those that are, are are more comfortable in a more traditional practice in some cases have left, and and you know at the end of the day people have to be where where is the, where there's a best fit for them and we wish them well and and uh, and move on Dar, what would you th- what, what do you feel is the key to really getting that culture that cuz you have a very strong sense of purpose i can tell just from the information you sent me before just the way we've been talking now what do you think is the key to getting that sense of purpose throughout the firm to create a culture where other people are excited about it it's not just you pushing from the top but it seems like everyone's pulling together yeah, well, it has. To, first of all, it has to be authentic. Uh, it has to. It actually, your words have to match your actions. So when you talk about, uh, you know, wanting to have uh, impact in the community or in the firm, you, you have to behave that way as a as a practice as well. You have to treat your your people with the same type of respect that that you do uh, externally. And so, uh, you know, as part of that process, we've had to look through our our policies, our our own internal. Uh, uh, systems. How are we? How are we um, reviewing staff? How are we helping them grow? How are we compensating people? Um, what is the benefit structure? Um, so we've participated in things like uh, just certification. We're a just certified firm. Uh, we're a living wage uh, certified employer. Uh, so first of all, you know, we're living it uh, internally uh, first and foremost. Um, uh, and, and so that's really important because if if the if the people within your firm don't uh, see it as being authentic, it'll I think it can have so much harm, right? And immediately you will lose credibility with with the people within the firm, uh, and they won't they won't be uh, they won't push uh, in the, in that direction. And and uh, so that that's that's really really important. Um, it, it's also required an ongoing dialogue with with the firm. It, it's not just one conversation. It's an ongoing conversation about what we're doing and why we're doing it, and then reminding people. And then when a new initiative comes in, putting it into that into that context uh, as well. So it 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 really requires an ongoing vigilance uh, to to be ensuring that people are understanding because some of it is confusing and some of it is. Um, uh, can be uh, destabilizing or create imbalance or or um, just confusion and and so you have to be looking out for that and keeping eyes you know uh, out within the firm to see okay are people getting this uh, is this clear uh, and then and then addressing that as as quickly as you can. Okay, so you talked about acting in integrity, actually having the actions match the words and the intent. Anything else that you do to help staff understand, be on board with, hey, this is our mission, this is our purpose? Well, we also really look for opportunities for them to participate in the in the initiatives that that we we do. Uh, many of the things that that we do that go beyond in that sort of third category that go beyond project or client related things are are initiatives that are driven by or suggested by our staff. So people will come and say, 
you know, here's this not-for-profit group in our community that's doing some really interesting work. They need they need somebody to get involved and 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 help them. Are we interested? We and and we make it look at it, make a decision, and and move forward. So those are staff-driven initiatives that we then get get behind, and those types of things really help as well. When 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 people within the firm see that they can actually bring their passions to the table, uh, and that we'll support that. Um, and, and that enables us. It's not just the things that I care about or the passions that I or the other partners. It's, you know, the, the passions and the interests and the, and the, and, and the desires of, of all the people within the firm. And so we can push in so many different directions because, you know, we can activate the people within the firm to, to, um, have impact within the areas of the community that, that really affect them most directly. Can you give me an example of something innovative or that we might not have heard out about before uh, that where you have implemented this social consciousness? Um, well, there's, I could give you a project specific example and I can talk about some of the things we're doing outside of the project specific example. Uh, rec- when we recognize that there really isn't a, uh, an established um, framework or methodology for integrating social impact in, in practice, uh, we developed one. So we developed our, uh, our social impact framework. We've been sharing that. Um, we've been talking about it and it's, it's organized our research and our methodologies and our design strategies. And so we're using that to structure our conversations with our clients. So, so now when we, we, uh, we start our projects, we start with a workshop that isn't about site planning. It isn't about program. It's about social impact goals. And so we set, those goals with the client at the beginning of, of the project. And we talk about the sort of social construct of the building, how it's going to be organized, what's the governance uh, of that going to be. And then once we've established that, we move forward with the physical design. So that's that's an example of how we're using and how we've developed a framework for, for projects that is having, I believe, really significant impact uh, in how we, how we deliver our work. As far as other... Uh, initiatives some are, are are more formal than others some are uh are community groups that we throw some support behind now it could be it could be a charitable donation or it could be actually giving some time on a pro bono basis to help a, a community group uh, get an initiative uh move an initiative forward we're working with a really interesting group in the uh in our local community that works with um uh people that to make their living by collecting uh, you know, cans and bottles that are lying around the city and, and, and trying to support them in, in supporting, uh, those members of our, of our community in, in better able to, to eke out their, their existence. Um, so that's an example of a community group that we're supporting. We also have a whole, uh, more formal structure. Uh, for us, it's called, um, we, we, we created a sort of an area of the practice that we call tilt, which is our, um, there's a section of the firm. Uh, where we've invested a, a portion of our profits uh, to to do a number of things, and some of it goes to our artists in residence program, some of it goes to um, uh, organizing speakers or conferences. We organize life drawing courses. We have a free life drawing uh, uh, class monthly in the in their office where we invite the design community in to draw. Uh, so that's a you know so there's so many different scales of initiatives that we're taking on. Um, uh, you know, some large and, and some, some small, some that last a day, some that last six, six months. And we're doing that sometimes through, through, uh, tilt, uh, that, that area of our practice. And sometimes it's just, uh, you know, individuals or groups of individuals within the firm. Daryl, have, have we left anything out about a purpose driven firm that you feel is important to state? Well, I think uh, I, I might be repeating myself, but I think one of the, the strongest lessons that uh, we've had uh, is that the clearer our purpose has been, uh, the stronger our business has been. Uh, that our business success uh, hasn't been at the expense of our purpose. I- in fact, it's been the exact opposite. opposite. And, and I really believe that regardless of your purpose, um, not everyone may share our passions for social impact. They may have a, a different purpose. And, but I think the, the clearer you are with your purpose, Um, the clearer you are in your business decisions and I think inevitably your business will be far more successful. Awesome. And that is a wrap. If you enjoyed today's conversation with Daryl Condon, uh, you will definitely enjoy my free training webinar on how to 
set up a firm and how to grow your business without fires and without feeling like you're spinning your wheels. As Daryl mentioned earlier in today's episode, there comes a time when you begin to outpace your systems. Maybe you've had some growth, maybe you just realize you're not earning as much money as you'd like, or you're looking back and wondering where all the time went. Well, there is a solution for each one of these problems, and you can start your journey on that solution by going to businessofarchitecture.com forward slash freedom webinar. On that webinar, you'll discover the tips, the tricks, and strategies that I recommend you implement in your firm to be able to get more of the freedom that you want. In addition, if you'd like to win better projects more consistently, I've put together another 60-minute training at architectwebinar.com. That's completely free, and you can view that from the comfort of your own home or office. Today's podcast is sponsored by BQE Core and Sage Glass. BQE Core is an all-in-one firm management software, beautiful graphical dashboard, completely customizable to give you up-to-the-minute updates and status reports on your firm, the profitability and the status of projects. Throw away the Excel spreadsheets and the little notepad. Stop keeping everything in your head. Go check out BQE Core. You can get a free trial at businessofarchitecture.com forward slash demo. Sage glass is a special kind of glass that automatically tints with the uh, with the changing sun. What it allows you to do is to optimize the view quarters in your buildings, uh, be able to do away with those dusty blinds and window treatments, all while maintaining those beautiful views that you like to have and also managing that glare and reducing heat. Ultimately allows you to create better buildings and better spaces. Visit sageglass.com to find out more about this remarkable material and decide if it's a fit for your next project. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment except to help you conquer the world. Carpe diem.